risen through the, the ranks like we have as staff and has achieved really great elected success, especially in a year where I think some of our um, elections didn't go exactly the way that we would have liked. We've had some ups and downs. But this is someone who um, we feel we can really support and, and welcome and continue to build the relationship between us as um, you know, members of the Wayne State Academic Staff and uh, Detroit City Council, other, other initiatives that Rick Hill is involved in. So, Demisha is going to read a brief biography, just to... Oh, to read a biography. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm late. Don't worry. I can say my biography. Okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you worked hard on your internet. And please, you can, you can stay and you can stay. Sure. It's up to you. I'll oh, stay. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was just walking really fast. I love my blood pressure for that. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Raquel Castaneda Lopez, City Council Member for the City of Detroit. I represent District 6. Um, and so this is a new, I'll talk about the district system a little bit and then my background and how it, I ended up running for office and then some of the initiatives that we're working on. Um, and there's always questions, so I'll, I'll leave some time for questions at the end. Uh, I do talk very quickly, partially because I don't have that much time, but just raise your hand if you can't hear me or you can't understand something that I just said. Um, is it okay if I stand for you? The recording? Yes, it's weird to look in. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> so um, the city council is now by districts. I think everyone in this room probably knows that. There's seven district members and there's two at-large members. I represent District 6 again, um, which is probably the, if you look at a map of the entire city, it's the larger southwest part of the city. So my eastern boundary is John R. So I have down half of downtown. I have half of the Tiger Stadium. Um, and then the southern boundary is the Detroit River. Um, and then I go up to the borders with Lincoln Park, Melvindale, Dearborn, and then kind of cut back in up to 96 West Chicago. So it kind of looks like a bouquet of roses on its side, if that makes sense. Well, it's so, Wayne State in it? Hmm? It's Wayne State. Yes, Wayne State. You guys are my northeast boundary. Yeah, Wayne State. <laughs> so, so if you think of neighborhoods, it's downtown, midtown, uh, Wayne, kind of some of the cultural district, Wayne State, um, Woodbridge, Corktown. Let's see, uh, what people refer to as Mexican Town, Chadzi Condon, Spring Wells, the larger Southwest, Delray area, um, 48217, the original Southwest, and then north of 96, north of um, Chadzi Condon. I don't know what that neighborhood is called historically, but West Chicago, Warren, Joy Road, Livernoy, 96 area. So it's not the largest geographically, but it is, I do have the largest in terms of population. So there's about 106, 107,000 people that live in District 6 that I represent. Um, I think it was a plus to go to the district system. Obviously, that was how I got elected. Um, one of the reasonings for going to district system was system, I, part of the reasoning was to allow for more uh, Represent, diverse representation and representation uh, from the entire city. Um, so I ran in 2013. I was at Wayne State for about four years, five years, I think, prior to then. I started off as a professional temp. I was brought into the Center for Chicano Boricua Studies at that time to uh, pilot a program. We were really successful, and then that became a full-time position. So then I ran that program for a couple years and stayed within the center and switched to another position. Uh, doing academic advising, I think it was academic advisor to, I think that was my title. Okay, I don't remember anymore. Um, so, right, recruited, taught a class, um, ran a mentorship program. Really, I loved my job at Wayne State uh, in terms of working with the students. Administration was difficult um, at times, but my work that I did with the students was amazing. Um, and, and I miss and I actually I miss working with the students part of it now. But we try to offer internships. So if you have any wonderful students that want to intern in my office, send them our way. Um, so how I decided to run for council. Um, my background is in social work, so I have my bachelor's and master's in social work. Never did I actually think I would end up working at a university, and never ever did I imagine ever working in politics or being a politician. I think me being more of a grassroots organizer and, um, and working in nonprofit sector, I kind of thought government was just the the opposite end of that spectrum. You know, the normal stereotypes. What's the stereotype we think of when we think of politicians, guys? Liar. I do this with students. <laughs> no, I do it with students when I go and they're like, you drive big cars, you guys are lazy, it's boring, <laughs> and you're corrupt, blah, 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 all these things. And, and yeah, and then we dispel all of those myths. Um, so those are very much my, my perspective of politics and politicians at that time. So... I was here at Wayne State. It was actually community members who recruited me to run for office 
Um, but yeah, I'm born and raised in southwest Detroit. I still live in the same house I grew up in. I'm the third eldest of eight, so I have six sisters and one brother. My family, my dad might have migrated from Mexico when he was a teenager, and my mom was born and raised in Detroit, but um, both grew up in very impoverished conditions and didn't have access to education. I was a first-generation college student, um, the first one to get my bachelor's and the first one to get my master's in my in my family. Um, but now all of my siblings, I think, are like, oh, PhD next, so they're all, they're all um, so yeah, it wasn't my path, but it was neighbors who I played soccer with that said, hey, you should run for council. It was people who I waitressed with when I was an undergrad. They're like, hey, you should run for council. And I had volunteered on the campaign to get it passed by council by district, but I never thought about running, and I was like, no, you're crazy. I never want to do that <laughs> ever, ever again in my ever in my life at all. And so it was a it was over a period of months that people were randomly texting me and saying run for council. Um, and then I attended a community meeting and we kind of looked at the people who had stepped up to run. And I don't think all the names were in at that point, but realized that there weren't people who are going to represent the entire district. So there's a lot of contrast in districts, and maybe I should mention that. The biggest disparity in terms of poverty um, and wealthy folks, if you think of downtown and then communities like Delray, highest education disparity gaps as well. Again, if we think of downtown and some of the other parts, we have some of the highest, we have the highest, I think, high school dropout rate, partially because um, District 6 also has the highest concentration of kids in the city. I have about 52 schools in District 6, more than any other district. Um, and that's charter, private, and public. I think I have about 20-something public schools, so definitely large concentration of kids there. Um, but so in, um, economic imbalance, injustices, uh, environmental issues in terms of having some of the most polluted zip codes in the whole state, and some places that definitely have more green infrastructure. So a lot of kind of uh, things that odd with each other in District 6. So, um, so yeah, a week before I had to file my signatures, I said, okay, I'll try. <laughs> and then able to collect those signatures, got my name on the ballot, and then I decided, and I was campaigning. Uh, it, it really throughout was a difficult process. Even after I won, guys, I went to a meditation retreat, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I can't do this. I'm not a politician. Uh, it's selling my soul here. But it was so helpful for those of you that don't meditate, and I highly, highly recommend it. I don't know how I would be surviving now if I, if I didn't. Um, but yeah, so I ran for office. I won. I was successful. I became the first Latina. I like to say I was the first person under five feet to win on Sunday. Because <laughs> I don't think anyone else is as short as I am. And when I see people in public, they're like, you look so much taller on TV. Like, what I really am sitting in my chair. I'm not doing anything else. Uh, so the transition to council uh, has been difficult, has been very, very difficult. And I think partially because as many of the stereotypes that you started to name, we think of politicians and politics as kind of just the same old, same old, right? And we don't really, to a certain extent, don't expect change and don't exp and don't demand it to a large extent. Uh, so we we kind of people become apathetic and don't vote. I was guilty. I didn't start voting till my mid twenties because no one told me it was important. No one said like, hey, you should vote. Like we care about your thoughts and you can have an impact, have a change. And so. Um, yeah, so coming into council, that's definitely been a challenge in that I don't have a typical politician political background. Uh, I wasn't necessarily, I was a part of the AFT, but I didn't have a lot of the big union support. Um, I didn't have tons of money. I didn't have a lot of political connections. I wasn't involved very actively with the Democratic Party. And so, um, and even to this to this day now, I, I don't have some of those networks. Um, and, and for me, that's okay. For me, for me, that's okay. Um, but being in office, and I think coming from an academic background and having a social work background, uh, I think it's incredibly important to have those voices at the table because it is a unique perspective that I bring to the table. Um, but it's challenging because oftentimes it's in conflict. Um, I, I will meet with the administration, and I don't agree on things, but I'm, I'm told this is just how it always works, Raquel. This is how things are done. And I can't tell you how frustrating it is when people tell this to me. Um, because I'm like, we're not in middle school. We don't have to play middle school politics games anymore. And it doesn't have to be the same. I think uh, it's just crazy. If you're making the same mistakes, why do we continue to make them? But there's such a level of resistance, I think, within government to change. People are very fearful and feel very threatened, um, which is why we continue to kind of perpetuate the same as, same as mentality. Um, but it, that's not to say that we haven't been successful in, in terms of the initiatives my office is pushing forward. But it, but it has been a kind of mental, a mental shift in terms of how things, how things operate, uh, and how you get things done in the political, I would say massaging of egos that happens on a daily basis to move <laughs> initiatives for initiatives forward. And, and, and when I ran for office again, I didn't think that I could do this. That was probably my biggest barrier. I cried every week. I was like, I'm not smart enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not strong enough. Whatever. I just wasn't enough of what I needed, what I thought I needed to be to be on council. Um, <laughs> And 
I still struggle with those things, but I've also come to the realization that anyone can run for office. Like, literally anyone can run for office. You don't need to be a lawyer. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be have a PhD. Uh, you don't need to have tons of political experience. For me, I think the most valuable skill set that I have, all the social workers in the room, is being able to, um, uh, to mediate, right, in really tense conversations, to be compassionate and to listen to both sides of the party. I, all, every single day I find myself in really difficult meetings, whether I'm being attacked personally or someone else is being attacked, um, but being able to separate, uh, be objective and to separate yourself from those personal feelings uh, to get the job done, essentially. So in council as a whole, um, I guess what we're doing, I think we have more of a social justice framework. Um, and so some of the things that we're trying to work on, I, so I co-chair the Immigration Task Force. I think I'm the first person from an immigrant community to serve on city council. And I didn't realize how rare that was until I was on council. And I'm all, I've now been labeled, I think, as the tree hugger. Um, as well as the, the immigrant person. And the department heads know now, right? So when I first got elected, people couldn't say my name. Um, and people were reluctant to try to say my name. And I remember the very first day I started to translate things into Spanish. And I felt so nervous. And it was dead silent when I spoke in Spanish. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I think this is the first time anyone has spoken in another language in this room. Um, and it was historic, but it was incredibly intimidating. But I think my presence just being at the table has brought it to people's consciousness that we do have people who are multilingual in our city, that we do have people who come from other countries in our city, and we need to be aware and sensitive to those needs. And that oftentimes their needs are one and the same as people born and raised in the city of Detroit. And I was born and raised in the city of Detroit. So uh, raising the level of consciousness around gender equity, around immigrant issues, um, are two things that we try to do. One thing I'm proud of is now when department heads come to the table, especially during budget hearings, Last year I asked, what are you doing to promote gender equity and to make sure we're hiring multilingual staff? And no one had an answer. This year they had an answer, but they didn't have any money. So um, <laughs> at least it was like, oh, and we're going to translate that into Spanish. Oh, and we're making sure that we hired somebody that can speak Arabic. So uh, it's, it's a start. It's, we're not there yet, but at least it's a start. Uh, but so I coach you the Immigration Task Force. That's something we're pushing forward. Um, we're also working around different ordinances around food trucks and public art and uh, pet coke and the community benefits agreement. And I'll talk about each one of those pretty quickly. But food trucks, you guys have food trucks on Wayne State. You're very fortunate. There you go, food trucks, right? Not everyone. How many of you guys here are fans of food trucks? Yeah, some, some people, yes, yeah, some people know. It is controversial. Um, but a lot of we have a lot of food trucks in Southwest Detroit, but not the rest of the city. I think it's our job as government to to support growing industries, and there's opportunity, and I think very much an interest in having more food trucks. They're just not regulated, so we need to create a, a lot. Why are they yes. Why a lot of the restaurant owners? Well, I guess somebody in here who does may not. If you want to play devil's advocate, you don't have to say if you really support or not. But if you want to talk about why you want to support food trucks, does anyone know something? This is how you can tell I was a teacher, right? Do you want to answer the question? <laughs> um, so restaurant owners, especially in Southwest, uh, are like, no, they're going to... These are kind of myths, and they've been dispelled throughout the country. But that they'll shut down the business. They'll come and park in front of a restaurant and sell the same type of food. The restaurant, because they have a brick-and-mortar building, they can't compete in terms of having higher costs. There's a myth in that food trucks can be really expensive. If, and depending on the size of the restaurant, they can be just as expensive. Two, you would have a, the law would regulate where they can and can't be, so we wouldn't say have them park in front of restaurants and sell food, the exact same food right in front of that restaurant. Um, that people are just doing illegal activity out of food trucks, that so they're not safe, they're not sanitary. It just promotes illegal activity and loitering. Um, so I'm trying to think of other, yeah, that it would destroy small businesses that already exist by allowing for food trucks. Yes, I say the same thing, but hey, there's adamant opposition to it at many different levels, but we're working on that. Um, public art. Yeah. yeah, we have. We also have food deserts in a lot of the parts of the city. So how do you address that? And, and they, they don't necessarily just have to sell, sell food that's already cooked. It could be selling fresh fruits and vegetables, right? It, providing access to produce where people may not have access to produce. Or even just home-cooked meals where people can only go to a gas station or can only go to Coney Island. And those are great locations, but... Um, but it's also difficult. I've definitely, I walked the whole district twice when I was campaigning, and there's definitely parts uh, where I would look forward to walking more because I could find a bathroom more easily in restaurants to stop and take a break, and others where it would just be a gas station and I would have to drive to Dearborn to, to use the restroom or to, to eat lunch or something. So, so yeah, public art, yes? Um, just to make a point of how mm -hmm. I've been in Cranes, I thought I'd walk over to our meal today, 
Uh -huh. They were the ones that first pushed for food trucks here at Wayne State. Mm -hmm. They had to appear before the city council 25 times. Okay. It became wow. their I was still at Wayne State then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you were. To give you credit, you were. Uh -huh. But it became their mission yeah. before city council because the only thing prior to them getting permission to come on Main State, the only thing that could be sold out of a food truck were hot dogs. Yep. The law hadn't been changed yet. Yeah. Well, there's no law. That's the problem. There's no law. There's just a state law, and there's no city law, so which creates a lot of the confusion. So we want to. I want to support that industry. Public art is how do we establish a fund within the city of Detroit that would fund local artists, um, and how do we make it easier for people who want to do murals and things like that to get them done and help distinguish between graffiti tagging um, and graffiti art or mural art. And I think that we have a really strong arts industry here, and I think that could be part of our revival. Uh, we don't necessarily view it in those ways. So, um, the community benefits agreement, many of you probably have heard about this. Uh, what it would do would be to require, if you get a public subsidy, we'll use the arena for example, they get a public subsidy, um, that they're required to provide some type of benefit for the surrounding community. And whether it's affordable housing, um, maintaining Cass Park, um, promoting walkability and bikeability, uh, supporting public art, really pushing for placemaking activities in their design. So that's more or less the community benefits. Very controversial business sector says it'll kill all business. Um, the un some unions on all also say it'll kill all job opportunities. Uh, community says no, if you're getting a public benefit, there should be some type of uh, benefit for the surrounding community that will be impacted. Um, and yeah, if you have any further questions, I can have to talk about that more. Yes, go ahead. Just a little bit of a side. I know that there's a bicycle group down on that riverfront mm -hmm. and some family business. Yeah. And they've been trying since 2009 to get on Bell mm -hmm. Island without success. Mm -hmm. Now DNR has come in and they did this elaborate bid process and they were just wiped out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they were not yeah. because they wanted somebody to do water bikes and snow stuff. Mm -hmm. So the person who won has never done bicycles. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a city of Detroit. Got it. So it's kind of sad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, it, so it's run by the state, as everybody knows. Yeah, but um, the city, they tried from 2009 until the state came to get this done. Sure. Could not get it done. Sure, for sure. So when I often come to meetings, I, I hear many concerns about things that have happened in the past. And I say, yes, guys. All I can do is apologize. I wasn't there, but how do we move forward, right? Um, so it's true. I mean, even now, there's people who are trying to do urban gardens um, that have been working and trying to purchase property for years um, are being told they have to restart the process with the land bank. So by no means is it perfect. I mean, I'm not going to come and say that Mayor Duncan is Jesus, although some people will like to think that. I think he's doing a great job, but for me, it's, it's not just a about putting band-aids on infrastructures, we need to think critically about how do we change those infrastructures. And we have this debate all the time, and he tells me, you're just too progressive. And I'm like, no, you can be just as progressive. <laughs> um, it's not just me. We can all be on the same page. So, and that's honestly, to a certain extent, the city's approach has been very reactionary. Let's, this, oh, this bus is broken, so let's fix it now, versus how do we prevent that from happening? Um, and uh, hopefully that ideology is, is going to change. But when you look at where the city has come, and, and really the dire situations that it's been in, people are happy just to have their garbage picked up and don't necessarily think about, oh, well, we just privatized waste management. What does that mean for us as a city moving forward? The same thing with the side lots in the land bank. There's a program to sell all these side lots to residents, um, but there's a very big questions around land use policy and who has access to that land in the future. And so, but people just kind of want ownership of these lots that they've been maintaining for years uh, and don't necessarily think longer term. Uh, and, and I would say, Council, many council members are guilty of that, as well as the administration. Is how do we shift from being very reactionary in our government and how we govern the city to being more proactive and thinking what are the long-term implications of the decisions that we're making today? So, um, so yeah, I don't know where I was, but I was talking about some legislative agendas. I obviously can talk very much a lot, guys. Um, but if you have specific questions, I can focus what I was saying, or I can answer questions. Yes. The insurance. Yes. The automobile insurance mm -hmm. debate has been um, in existence since I was a little kid, and that was a very, very long, 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 long time ago. I don't think without, it's that long. <laughs> without telling my age, and it still continues to uh, hamper, I believe, growth uh, with people that are coming back to the city, but they go back out of the city because they cannot afford car insurance. Sure. More hit and runs uh, because people 
can't afford to have insurance, mm -hmm. uh, you're left holding the bag. Um, it's, when will that ever, mm -hmm. I'm not saying be solved, but sure. really be addressed? I know Mayor Duggan is trying to start a new initiative yeah. for a Detroit um, Mm -hmm. uh, Detroit resident insurance company mm -hmm. only, mm -hmm. but it, it is a huge, huge issue yeah. for all of us. I'm mm -hmm. born and raised in the city mm -hmm. um, to be able to maintain, and my kids are, uh, it wasn't a big excuse for my kids were uh, living at home, sure. but I'm an empty nester now, and it's just me, mm -hmm. and I'm paying more in insurance premiums than I was when my kids were in the city driving yeah. under the age of uh, 25. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a quick fix, and to a certain extent, I don't know that the proposal that Duggan has put forward or the initiative is going to work because there's a lot <laughs> of legislative and bureau bureaucratic kind of red tape to go through. Really, I think the conversation should focus on, one, what are alternative uh, insurance programs that we can offer to residents in the city, but also, two, how do you hold the insurance industry accountable for blatantly redlining and discriminating, which I would say is place I can't, class and race. And that, I think, is part of the larger conversation. Um, and people focus on, well, how do we get an insurance policy for Detroit? That's only one piece of it. Um, and I think a, a more difficult, well, maybe it's not more difficult, right? I think to regulate the insurance company and say this is this is illegal. What you're doing um, is also very difficult, which is why it hasn't happened. I mean, if they control the legislation and the legislators, so right to a certain extent that those changes are going to happen. So I mean, I could say, oh yeah, we're working on the deal insurance. It's going to happen by the end of this year, but that's not that's not true. Um, no, I mean, I wholeheartedly support us having a different, a different uh, insurance policy for the residents in the city, um, but that has to be approved by the state as well. And historically, we have not had very good relationships with the state. And people benefit financially oh, from absolutely. from residents in the city of Detroit from charging these high rates. Um, so it's it's not going to be easy. Yeah. I think it like down just my focus is Belle Isle. Uh, but down on Belle Isle, we saw, uh, you know, 50% drop in people attending the place, and one of the reasons is because if they're stopped by the police and they don't have insurance, car insurance, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So they can't, and with state police being there, you know, they can happen. And it may be just a stop if they mind your stuff and they find out you don't have insurance, you're in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it is sort of affecting the city in many ways. Yeah. <coughs> For sure. There was another question. Someone had their hand up over there earlier. Questions. It doesn't have to be related to city council. If you live in the district and you have a question about recycling, about whatever. What happened so. to the recycling place that used to be over by Henry Ford? Somebody told me it's closed now. No, recycle here is still open. The city does have a curbside recycling program, so if you live in the city, I would highly encourage you to sign up for it. Um, uh, but the Recycle Here program is still open because the curbside recycling doesn't take styrofoam and it doesn't take aseptic and there's some other products that they don't take. So they still are open to take those. Somebody told me it's closed. <laughs> yeah, as far as I know, it's not closed. They've closed some of their, their sites in the communities. Like there was one in Southwest, which they shut down. So I don't know. I think they've cut back on the sites they used to do in other places in the city, but the site itself over here is still open. Does the city maintain a contract with Recycle there still is a con there was a contract. There still is a contract. It's just been reduced because the number of products have been reduced that they would recycle. Yeah. Okay. So for wrapping up, question. So I have to yes. Go ahead. I mean, question is it possible to form a public trust fund of some sort to cover people who cannot afford I mean, I I don't know. I, I'm not an insurance expert at all. We had the feds coming in and working uh, to consult us on what the program would look like. And I, it's, I don't think that they finished doing their analysis. And, and for, yeah, I haven't seen the final report on what the options would be. But we did have people from the federal government, Obama sent a team to work specifically and talk about the insurance programs and the different options. It could be, but I'm just not that familiar with, with it. Yes? A lot, of, uh, a lot of talk about how progressive the approach to community benefits of this is here uh, as a as a legislative mm -hmm. initiative. Mm -hmm. Are you working on multiple funds, though, to deal specifically with the issue of CBAs and the Delray Bridge uh, project? Yes. Are, so there, are, there other, are there other sort of negotiations with that project to see that some of 
So those, this is the thing that's been happening with community benefits is they've been project specific and so it's kind of been a piecemeal approach. So district, that falls in District 6, I actually live like a mile away from it um, and have been attending meetings since way before I was elected. Um, and yes, we establish a community advisory group. The difficulty with the whole bridge project is that it's an agreement between the state and the Canadian federal government. So the city is not party to that agreement at all. So technically, we're, they don't have to talk to us at all about what happens with Are that. you shut out of the process, though? I mean, do you we are know? trying not to be shut out of the process. Um, but there's nothing to legally bind them to, to having conversations with us. Because it's between the state and the federal government, um, they don't have to talk to the mayor or to the city council. So the legislative initiative is a way to get a, seat, a guaranteed seat at that table. Uh, yes and no. The legislative initiative is a policy for the city as a whole. On any project that would come in, depending on the size and depending on the, the, the environmental impact, um, would trigger different things. And it may, it may be that the a CB, and the CBA isn't necessarily guaranteed. Um, it depends on the project and the level of impact. If someone's just redoing the inside of their hotel, it may not have an outside impact. So to what extent is the CBA required? It might just be uh, around jobs and making sure that they hire Detroit-based contractors. But with the bridge, there's a lot more or there's going to have a much broader impact. So, yes, there's a group that was formed in OA, the Southwest Community Benefits Coalition, that has been negotiating around this for years. Um, I started working with them when I got elected. But to a certain extent, the state won't acknowledge the community. It's kind of this divide and conquer strategy. You represent community, you represent business. Michelle tells me she doesn't like the people over here. I'm the governor's office. Well, Michelle told me she doesn't like them, so you guys really aren't representative of the entire community, so I'm going to listen to Michelle. And then I go over here. So it, that's the thing. It's divide and conquer, and so that's very much the strategy that's been used. So the city council created a community advisory group, but the state won't acknowledge the, the community advisory group until the mayor supports the community advisory group. So we're trying to draft a, doc a document that would essentially say the state is going to work with the city council and the mayor and the community to negotiate around the Canada Bridge, which you think would make sense, right? But no, is that it doesn't make sense. Is that the Detroit Advisory Council? Is that totally separate? I don't know what the Detroit Advisory Council is, but yes, this community advisory council okay. is separate okay. and it's just specific to the Delray project, or the bridge, okay. the new international trade crossing. Okay. Yeah. There was a yes, special thing. Um, <coughs> So you have Wayne State um, in your area, so I'm just wondering um, if there's anything in the future about about Wayne State that's happening in this area and, um, uh, that you're aware of and what the city is doing to build on you know, the, what's happening at the university. Um, and then I also um, have the second part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you know, I'm a mother of many children. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm also concerned about um, employment for a lot of kids mm -hmm. out here, which I think is really critical. Mm -hmm. you know, the rate is so high, um, especially among youth in Detroit. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if you could speak to any programming or initiatives that might be focused on sure. um, Wayne State and then also on sure. employment. So to, I would say at this point, I don't think there's any way to see specific initiatives. Me personally, coming from academia, academia, um, I, I would like there to be a, a stronger bridge between what the decisions we make legislatively and what happens in academia, because really we're not the experts, right? And people make these decisions by just skimming through reports and think, oh, well, this is a great policy, so I'm going to enact this. Um, I think we see that happen at the state level as well. So I would love to see more partnerships between universities and elected officials of professors who are actually doing the research, right, and, and know what the impact is going to be um, because they've studied this their whole lives so that we as legislators aren't just like, oh, I thought of this in the shower, and this is what I think is a good idea, and I'm going to push it forward, because uh, that happens, uh, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I know my office, uh, we have students, again, more in terms of internships, but with UMish, Wayne State, Eastern, I don't know if we have with Henry Ford or not right now. I don't think so. But part of what we're trying to do, for example, with urban planning classes is to get them, the city doesn't have money still, although we're not in bankruptcy, but to get classes to do specific projects in, in the district and in the city in partnership with universities, um, whether it's a senior thesis or, or whatever the class is. Um, one, I think it promotes civic engagement and also to uh, gives, um, it helps build that relationships between government and, and academia as a whole. So no initiatives that I know of offhand. Would I like to see more partnership? I think for sure. I think as a city of Detroit, one, we don't, we don't have any authority over the over DPS. That may change in the future, but this kind of separation between the two, education and then the local government. But I do think we should do a better job about supporting, or at least being vocal about our support of public institutions um, at all levels. City Council has its own plan. 
No, we do not have our own planning group. I'm the liaison from City Council to DPS, but no, there's a coalition, which I serve on and several other co co uh, council members serve on, but there's, City Council doesn't have its own initiative. Well, I know there's been some kind of a problem going on because if U of M is able to get to that, the white state has never been able to get to it. If you send me information, I don't know what that is, but there's not a city council initiative. I started a youth task force, a youth and education task force, which still hasn't met. Um, and actually, Council Member Ayers is taking over that initiative. But that there's no city council initiative around education. I think this is in planning. Yeah, so I guess maybe to explain council and the administration, we have no authority over the departments. There's actually a provision in the charter that says you cannot talk to anyone in the administration without approval from the mayor's office. Um, and if you do things that the mayor doesn't like, that provision is enforced. So um, it, planning and development falls with underneath the administration. So we, they may be working on projects, and we have no idea until it comes to the city council table. So oftentimes people will ask us, well, what about the lights, or what about this proposal, or what? And, and we don't have the information because we, they don't give it to us until the end. I think there should be more collaboration and sharing of that information, but that doesn't happen, unfortunately. I, I think uh, it's true. The council and the, and the mayor are working much better than they have historically. There's a certain level of professionalism, which is awesome. But I think that's a minimum, guys. I actually am insulted when they're like, oh, well, everyone's being behaving professionally and getting along. It's like, that's nice, but okay, what else are they doing? Great. You behave professionally. That's wonderful. Okay, let's do something else now. <laughs> so, but, yeah, the, there's still this tension between the two bodies of government, and Oftentimes, we don't get information until the day before or the day of, and then are expected to vote on it. Oftentimes, then we, and this is me venting as a council person, uh, right? And then in the media, it's, oh, council is holding up the process when it's been in the administration for six months or years. So this initiative you're talking about, I've never heard of the initiative. I was told that the, the initiative was with the city council. They had a separate planning group that they had uh, internships. And I know that there are a number of new young students who were in those internships and Wayne State as planning, I'm a planning graduate, sure. master's program, it was nothing with the city. Nothing. Yeah. So there's not, I 100% positive, there's nothing with city council. Each individual office may have relationships um, with universities and have interns of their own. Um, I honestly don't know how many. I know my office has the most. I think we have like six or seven interns now. I would love to take an intern from Wayne State. Um, but that may be, again, in the planning falls underneath the administration. There's the city planning commission staff, which fall under city council. And then there's the city planning commission board, which kind of falls in council, but those are people appointed to those positions. So if you want to email me, I don't think I have enough of my cards, but I can leave my contact information. Um, for If there's any additional questions um, or concerns that you want to follow up with or figure out how to get into some of these departments to work with them, definitely let me know. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have authority over the, the administration of these departments, so it's not, it's not in council. So sorry. Yeah. Yes, last question, because I'm looking for another panel. <laughs> yes. Are you optimistic that the bankruptcy proceedings actually solve something? Or you see it, it just might be back, you know, 10 years from now, it might be bankruptcy again. No, I mean, I think, yes, it obviously got rid of a lot of our legacy debt. And so in that way, I think it helped address some of the financial crisis that we were in. But there really needs to be infrastructural change to prevent us from being back in that situation. And we can't have a band-aid approach. If, for example, I'll take the bus system. We have a very flawed bus system. Um, and what's being done is to get more buses, to have more buses to fulfill these routes. And that's great, but I think the other part of the conversation has to be an analysis of those routes and to what extent are those routes still valid and do we need to change them and are they serving the needs of the existing population. And so to just get more buses on the streets to meet the existing schedule, if the existing schedule is flawed and not meeting the needs of people who use that service, why are we just getting more buses on the streets? So I think in that way, if we don't shift our way of thinking in terms of how we look at our government and the services that we deliver, we can find ourselves in that same situation. And I know we're in Detroit, obviously, and Detroit is very unique, and native Detroiters, like, no one else understands what we're going through, right? Um, but I've been fortunate enough to travel abroad in, in, in the States, and really, it's, it's kind of a trend. Post-industrial cities go through financial crisis, and then they determine what path they're going to choose. And I love Chicago, I love New York, I think they're wonderful, but they're incredibly segregated and gentrified. And there's areas where it's kind of the have and have nots. And I don't want to see Detroit go down that path. So I would like us to really think about how we do development uh, differently in our land use pol policy in a, maybe in a more progressive way um, so that we are remaining as diverse and inclusive as possible um, and that we're really fixing infrastructures and not just putting band-aids on them. Yes? 
follow up to that. Mm -hmm. um, they're concerned about the role that some of the nonprofits are playing. Mm -hmm. They're, on the one hand, seen as these good guys, but on the other hand, they're not accountable to this sort of democratic way. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, there's some nonprofits that are wonderful and some that maybe aren't that great. And so um, I do think that you can always have more accountability, and part of that is through the boards that are people are at the appointing system to these boards that run the nonprofits. And we know that a lot of boards aren't necessarily diverse and don't always reflect the communities that they're serving. Um, so what do we do to change that? Um, but there, and then there's also, I think, in terms of the type of nonprofits, Oftentimes, the smaller kind of grassroots nonprofits that are really servicing some basic needs uh, are overlooked for grants and funding op opportunities. So it's not just the nonprofits; it's also the foundations um, and whoever else is giving funding to these organizations. And it's the larger ones that have more credibility and have more capacity um, that get that get these funding opportunities and then are able to roll out the program where the smaller ones suffer. Um, so I think promoting partnerships is one piece, more diversity in terms of the boards. Um, and then, I mean, there has been conversations by some people about creating this larger board of nonprofits to see where they open, to make sure they're accountable. I think that's really controversial because they each have their own individual boards. How do you have a board of nonprofits? So, I mean, I don't necessarily know a solution to fix the problem, but I think funders need to do a better job about making sure that they're not just funding um, certain nonprofits that look a certain way um, and that they're being more diverse about who they fund as well as the nonprofits making sure that their board really represents the constituency that they're serving. Okay, okay cool. I have to go because I have to go to another panel. Um, but thank you guys so much for your time. And really, I would love to stay in touch. Um, I'm super passionate about education and, and serving young people. All of you guys are the advisors. But you're still young at heart, right? Um, <laughs> and so that's my commitment is to visit all of the schools in the district. Wayne State is one of those schools. So let me know if there's anything I could do to be supportive. If you have questions about whatever it is, more than willing to answer. Our mission is really all about increasing access to information and resources. I'm a big believer that access to information is access to power um, and helping to demystify the political process. So tons of volunteer opportunities. We're door knocking this weekend for foreclosure prevention if anybody wants to go. Um, would love to hold students and interns. Uh, my chief of staff is actually was my intern when I worked here at Wayne State. She was my MSW intern and now she's one of my co-chief of staffs. So super excited about that and we have a Wayne State MSW student this year. Um, but yeah, Mike, I'm very much committed to making sure, although I went to you at Mish, I love you Mish guys, but I, I know how you Mish is. So I want to make sure that we're supporting other institutions throughout the, throughout the city as well. Your email address? Oh, so my phone number first, which is actually the best way to get in touch because I'm always in meetings, is 313-224-2450. That's the, and Claudia Meeks is the boss. She's the real boss. That's the gatekeeper, right? She does my scheduling. She answers the phone. She's amazing. 313-224-2450. Um, Claudia Meeks is my office manager, but depending on what you need, she may or may not be the person you follow up with. And then my email address is councilmember Raquel, just my first name. So councilmember Raquel at DetroitMI.gov. And then we have a Facebook, we have a Tumblr, we have a Twitter, we have an Instagram. We hit my 13 year old niece telling how to do this. Um, <laughs> but follow us. We put a lot of information up there. If you guys have college job opportunities, upcoming events, again, you follow within the district. We try to make sure that we post and share that information as much as possible. Can you repeat Yes, sure. Council member Raquel. Council member R A Q U E L at DetroitMI.gov. So there's only one period. One period in there. And I think also, too, usually I wrap up when I talk to students is people ask me all these questions about what are you doing to fix the city? And then I always wrap up with the students is what role, what are you doing to help make the community better and make the city better, right? And I usually would make everyone go around and answer, but I don't have time to do that. But really to think about it, I'm one person and I represent 106,000 people. Um, and with the students I talk to, they're like, oh, grown-ups handle all the problems. And then when I talk to adults, it's like, who handles all the problems? By no means can I fix it. So I need you guys really to be the eyes and the ears on the streets. If you see a pothole, you see a burnt house, whatever it is, to let us know that's part of it. And the other piece is to, if you live in the city, step up, start a block club, start a TV patrol, like whatever the need is of your surrounding community, to step up and play a role in making the change uh, that you want to see happen. Because we can't just rely on our elected officials to do that, because really, they, they can't. Um, it needs to be uh, uh, working together that we accomplish those things. So, so. Cool. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Thank you.